Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I wasn't sure, like, what to expect the day after, but it's good. I was trying to think about how to greet everyone this morning because we've been saying Merry Christmas, and today is known for, if you've ever been around retail people at all, it's known for the busiest gift card shopping day and merchandise return and exchange day of the year. But I didn't think saying, Merry busiest gift card exchange, <laughs> and then seeing how quick you were to respond would quite work out. So I'll say one more day, Merry Christmas, everyone. I hope you had a wonderful celebration, um, and if you miss them, we had an awesome uh, Christmas Eve uh, services here, and there's one online that we recorded that's just for online. So if you get bored and you want to hear Janet and I sing, then feel free to uh, pull that up on the Facebook page. Uh, so we're going to open up with singing a Christmas song, if you want to stand and join us. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. All right, we're going to do something. You need to turn your microphone on. <laughs> All right. And do we have my guitar, Jake? Okay, cool. Just making sure. You start with the verse now? I just thought it would be better if people could hear you. <laughs> I don't know. While shepherds kept their watching or silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens, there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hail our Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a lowly manger, the humble Christ was born. And brought us God's salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is for us. Sing it out. Go tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. All right, you may be seated. Good morning, St. Andrews, and Merry Christmas. Um, if you are here today in the building or if you are at home in your jammies with a cup of coffee, I'm so happy we can all still be together. What a wonderful thing to be able to, to celebrate. And it still is considered on the um, church calendar Christmas time and will be through Epiphany. And so you are welcome to say it as much as you want. Merry Christmas works all week long. So um, we have a couple of announcements. Did I introduce myself? Okay, my name is Jane Rideout, and I am the co-lead pastor along with my husband, Gary, who will be bringing the message today. And so if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, if you're visiting today, I hope that I will get a chance after the service just to say hello. Um, but if you are in the um, online, go ahead and put your name in the chat space. If this is your first Sunday with us, we would love to, to meet you. Um, following this service today, we've got a few poinsettias left from our Christmas Eve service. So if you meant to get yourself a poinsettia all year long and didn't, please grab one and take it home with you. 
If you don't want any more poinsettias at your house, we still have a big favor for you. If you could grab a poinsettia and just carry it out the door, and when you go down, um, as you as you're go through the breezeway, there's a table at the very end, and move it there for us. We're going to get ready for worship on the 2nd, and so if you could help us move those, and then we're going to set up the chancel for that service as well. That'd be very helpful. So take them if you would like to have them. It's your free gift, and if not, if you just want to carry one down, that would be spectacular. Um, on the second, we're very excited to say we'll have a guest speaker, Reverend Susan Lewis. I've had so many of you say um, she's always just been such a, has a special place in your heart for her, and she's a wonderful speaker. And so she's going to bless us next Sunday, and I'm really excited about that as well. Now, at some point, we're going to have to take all the greenery down and hear all these amazing trees. It's all going to come down. We're not going to do it next Sunday, which would be the normal time to do it. We are going to wait until January 6th in the morning. It's a Thursday, and we're going to um, take it all down that day. So if you happen to be free on that day, I know a lot of you will be back to work, but if you're free on January 6th at 9 a.m., we'd like to invite you to come meet us here in the sanctuary, and we're going to just take all the hanging of the greens, and we're going to take it down and put it away for next year. So that is an open invitation to anybody who would like to do that. If you're one of those people who have a good sense of order, then come, because you're going to feel full of order as you put everything away. So, um, But we could use everybody's help because it's all over, the, all the buildings, outside, everything, so it'll be a big job. But that's okay, too. And I think that is everything for now. Um, let's go ahead and continue worshiping on this Christmas morning, day after Christmas morning. Why don't you stand and join us? Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where they 
lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so Father, we come before you this morning and uh, just to continue honoring you for the fact that you showed love to us by coming to the earth and dwelling with us. And I pray that that's something that will carry on through the year um, and next year, not just at Christmas time, is that that love that you've shown us and that we'll show that to other people. In your name, amen. We may be seated. Everybody? Yeah. Weren't we just here? So, I thought what I thought. That's what I thought. So, uh, you know, Jane reminded me when she's talking about the people on live stream being home in their jammies. Some churches, the Sunday after Christmas is Jammy Sunday. You can wear your jammies to the sanctuary. How many would be up for that? Oh, wow. More than I thought. <laughs> so, not, not say we're doing it, but I just was curious. Taking a poll here. So here we are in between, um, uh, Christmas is over with uh, for this year, and we're moving on to the, the new year. And it's interesting, we're in that time period that uh, after the birth narrative of Jesus, up until he's baptized by John the Baptist in, in the Jordan River, we have very little knowledge written about what, what, what happened to Jesus during that time. From birth to baptism, we don't know what happened, except for one little scene and that is our scripture reading for de today, when Jane, uh, Jesus was 12 years old. So let's read Luke, uh, follow me with Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind him in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and answers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this story in scripture always reminds me, every time I hear it, it reminds me of an incident that happened in our family. No, my parents didn't go off and leave me, but uh, what happened was, I was probably about in the seventh grade at this time, and uh, our family went on a picnic outing. We lived in southern Indiana, and just across the Ohio River, 
there was a, uh, in Kentucky, there was a state park, Audubon State Park, a great state park, named after uh, uh, John James Audubon, who's uh, the great naturalist and artist, and he lived in that area when he was an adult. So we settled in at a picnic table, and over to the side, there was this, you know, these covered p pavilions that had a very large family gathered. It looked like they were having a family reunion or something. So it was getting later in the afternoon when the family in the, in the pavilion began cleaning off the tables. They got started loading up the car, and they said goodbye to everybody, and everybody took off. About 15 minutes later, a little six-year-old boy comes walking up, very puzzled, <laughs> looking around, looking in the pavilion, uh, he, and, and just stops, looking intently. Suddenly, he realized that everyone had left without him. They had gone, and no one noticed. Everyone had left without him. Surprisingly, the little boy didn't cry. He was very calm about the whole thing. Thinking, well, maybe they've done this before. So, but he was very calm. My mother went over to him and said, asked the obvious. He goes, did they go off and leave you? And he said, yes, ma'am, they did. So they, he, he sat with us. And, uh, uh, and so we thought, well, they're eventually going to come back and get them. Uh, we waited an hour, and no one did. So we, uh, we took the little boy. We took him home. But... There was a problem. He didn't know his address. Didn't know where he lived. So, uh, and, and he, uh, the, you know, this was years before cell phones, but it didn't make a difference anyway because he didn't know his phone number either. So we tried to ask around and said how to figure out how to get him home. Finally, he knew the name of the school he went to. And I said, well, if we go to your school, can, do you know how to get home from your school? Yes, I do. I know how to do that. So... Uh, so we drove him to his school, and luckily he, he, he didn't live very far from us. So we took him to his school, and we followed the path to his house. And my stepfather walked to the door and, and, and explained to the boy's father who had entered the door, and I wish I would have been there to hear this conversation, but I wasn't. And th they haven't even noticed that their six, the six-year-old son they left behind. No one did. So we drove away, and we're relieved that we finally found the, the, the boy, finally got him home safely and returned him to his family. But we were so unbelievable and preposterous. We were dumbfounded. Who would go off, leave their son behind, and not even notice that he wasn't there? So we could kind of say the same thing with Jesus' earthly parents, Joseph and Mary. Uh, you know, how could they go off, leave your son behind, and not even notice he wasn't with him traveling back home. And they'd gone a full day before they even realized it. And, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that Joseph and Mary were, were bad parents or neg negligent parents. We know from Scripture, Mary is very loving, very caring, very compassionate. We can only imagine she was very distraught and hysterical that her 12-year-old son was not with him. So, um... In this case, there is a good explanation. We can't say Joseph and Mary was being negligent. And when traveling in those days, people traveled in very large groups, a caravan of people, multiple families traveling together, relatives traveling together. So just because your children were not, not right next to you, they were probably somewhere in the caravan somewhere uh, with, with, with other kids, with other relatives, with cousins, uh, with other teenage children. It was a common custom. And there was nothing to be concerned about until Mary started looking for him and realized he's not here in this caravan. So he, he, they rushed back to Jerusalem. And said, well, let's go get him. He probably has to be back there in Jerusalem. They hunted around for three days, but they finally found him. And of all places, he was in the temple. He was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. This was kind of a different side to Jesus that Joseph and Mary had not seen before. Have you ever had that experience with your younger children that there's one point you go, oh my gosh, they've grown up. They've grown, they're almost adults now. This is kind of what maybe G Joseph and Mary thought of Jesus. Here was a little boy uh, was, you know, having his learned conversation with religious leaders of the day. Everyone, it says, was amazed at Jesus' understanding, which I would presume that Joseph and Mary was amazed too. You know, I, I wonder how they felt. Oh, our little boy's grown up. Well, he is the son of God. I mean, there's a little, di little difference there. But they, I'm sure as p human parents, typical parents, this, our boy is growing up too fast. He's growing up too fast. 
So like I say, the, the story, this story in the gospel is the only account about Jesus we have between his infancy and his baptism. And it's a story about a parent's worst nightmare, losing a child. Jesus is lost and cannot be found by his parents. Yet it kind of relates to us where we sit right now these days after Christmas. Our focus during the whole Advent, the, the, the weeks before Christmas, is on the Christ child who is sent by God to be with us. But then Christmas is over, and sometimes we lose sight of that. We kind of put it in our, our, our back of our mind on the, on, the, on, the, on the back burner because we're distracted by other influences. We don't have to pre prepare for Christmas anymore. We for, maybe forget about Jesus. We get busy cleaning away all rem remnants of Christmas, and we often just leave them in the manger until next year when we pull them out again that we leave him in the manger forever to be that holy infant so tender and mild. And that's how we look at him. You know, since it's the day after Christmas, I, when we hear the name Jesus, our thoughts are the baby, the baby in the manger in swaddling clothes. No crying he makes, so, so peaceful, so calm. All is calm, all is bright. What an angelic and, and a serene scene. With all the struggles and the challenges that we face in our world today, in the past, especially in the past year, we're kind of still basking in that peacefulness and that serenity of Christmas. We're still relishing those family times together and the joy that goes with this time of the year. Don't we wish that the joy of the season could last all year round? Don't we wish that the babe in the manger would be a permanent presence in our lives? Yet, that is one of the big dangers of the Christmas season. That is, we just leave Jesus in the manger. We lose sight of him and why he came to be with us. That he is simply this, we leave him as this just simple, lovable infant in the crib, smiling and cooing. And he doesn't make any demands on our life, on anybody. He's just a baby. He just lies there and looks sweet. And every year, you know, we, we pull our nativity scene out of the attic or out of the closet and, and with the rest of the nativity scene. And every, every year we bring it out and say, oh, we look at the baby Jesus in the manger. Oh, how cute, how cute it is. And then when Christmas is over, it goes back up in the storage. We forget about him. We lose sight of him. We just see him as the baby in the manger. When we lose sight of Christ in Christmas, then we see him only as someone who is a, a kind of a role in the story that we tell every year, as old as the ages. A story in a storybook that we dust off each year and read about it. The story of a miracle, or you might look at it as a very first century oddity of virgin birth. We, we marvel at the miraculous, the, the miraculous and the splendor of a baby born to a virgin in a manger in a stable surrounded by animals because there was no room in the inn. A birth that attracted the attention of lowly shepherds uh, and dignified kings. We wonder and marvel at, at the story, then roll up the text and we save it for next year. Just put it away until next Christmas. Instead of looking at that baby, that Christ, as a reality in our lives. A plan for God and his people for all humankind in all times. That God gave us Jesus for a reason. We lose sight of seeing Jesus as the fulfillment of a plan by God for his people, for all humankind. For God had a reason for sending us Jesus. A reason beyond that virgin, the story, the virgin birth and the star in the east. And even though in this season we look in the manger and see a cute and innocent baby, the splendor of that silent night, we must realize that the Christ child was the one that was brought to, to the world for us. Brought to the world for us to deepen our understanding of the message of Christmas. We need to reflect on who this baby is and was, who that would become and why Jesus came. For his life gives us life. His life gives us life, now and into eternity. Otherwise, if we don't, we just leave him lying in a manger until next year. Years ago, there used to be, I don't know if they still is now, but maybe 30 years ago, there used to be a phrase bannered around churches that I don't see much anymore. They'd be on billboards and bumper stickers and bookmarks and church banners, and it would say, Christ is the answer. Christ is the answer. 
It was everywhere. Christ is the answer. And I remember uh, uh, one of my sarcastic friends of mine was reading that phrase, and he half seriously remarked, well, if Christ is the answer, what is the question? You know, that's not a bad response, to be honest with you. For us to truly understand the gift of Christmas, we must understand why Jesus is the answer to that great question mark in our life. Why Jesus is the solution to our human problem. Why did God need to come to us in the flesh other than it makes a great story and a terrific reason to have a holiday on December 25th? Why Christmas is a holy and special day and just a birthday celebration for a baby born sometime back in, in Bethlehem? That's the question, question where we must begin. Why did God have to act? Why did God choose to enter into human existence? We have to look deeply into our human interaction, our human situation. We, we start all the way back to Adam and Eve. God gave them everything they needed. They were in paradise. Everything was provided for them, and they didn't have to lift one finger to make it happen. God made it happen. But they had one rule, one thing that was forbidden. They had complete freedom except for that one thing, and they didn't like that. They wanted everything. They thought to themselves, as we do now, that's not fair. Why is God withholding from us that one thing from us? We're the ones that know what's best for us. All these rules are too stifling, even if it's just one rule. I, I, I know God. It's only one rule. But hey, why are you forbidding us to do this, to eat of the forbidden fruit? We deserve everything. So they crossed over the boundary ate the forbidden fruit, and then tried to cover it up when they had done. That was just the beginning of humankind's damaged relationship with God. There was the incident of Cain killing his brother Abel, and the abandoned plan to build this tower to the heaven of the Tower of Babel so they could be just like God, so humans could be just like God. Yet, did God give up on his creation? No. In fact, he tried to reach out in a different way, uh, through a family of people, started with Abraham, that would hopefully be a righteous example for all the nations. But instead, they exhibited dysfunction, corruption, and deceit that rivals today's reality TV. Abraham, as a righteous man as he was, had a little trouble telling the truth. Isaac couldn't make a right decision if his life depended on it. Jacob, well, when they name you a name that really means back in those days, trickster, that's a bad sign. That pretty much tells his story. So God sent a line of kings, a righteous kings that would rule in a righteous and holy manner. There was David, probably the best of the kings, but he had too much, spent too much time admiring himself. Solomon was too busy counting his riches. God tried to reach out to his people through special messengers called prophets. There was Jeremiah, but he wasn't very well liked. So people kind of ignored him. Isaiah, he talked too much in hyperbole, and most people didn't understand what he was saying. And then there was John the Baptist. Well, he was just a wild man that people ignored and just really needed a more balanced diet than nuts and honey. God watched as his people tried to deal with their own life's troubles and turmoil. He saw what his people were up against, the danger they were inflicting on themselves, open rebellion due to unfaithfulness, selfish pride, self-centeredness, immorality, and lack of compassion for one another. God saw the human condition. God saw our human condition. For these, these things I just talked about describe us as well as those who lived in Jesus' time. If you sit here today thinking none of these describes where I'm at, well, you haven't looked deep enough underneath the facade of your own being. I think the phrase is, you're in denial. <laughs> For these things describe who we are too. Yet God did not give up on us. God would not leave us this way. Even though we don't deserve it, God still reached out to us with his great love, still seeking our attention to accept his love and grace, to get through the turmoils in our life, the challenges in our life, and God did something pretty incredible. He knew that in all his reaching out to us, 
there was still one barrier, that barrier between the divine and humanity. And he decided to break that barrier. He responded in a most astonishing way to come to us, one of us, vulnerable and innocent. The message of Christmas is that through Jesus, God has sought to address our human condition, to be our deliverer, to be our savior. We need a savior. God knew that. We need a savior. If we're really honest with ourselves, we, we needed a path that would address our own human condition. And this is what God has done through the giving of his son, the baby Jesus lying in the manger. Christmas is a time to remind us that God goes to great length to show us his great love. And by stepping out of heaven to be with us through Jesus Christ. And if we just leave Jesus in that manger, pull him out every year at Christmas, we'll miss that completely. Miss it completely. Yet the message of Christmas is also a message of what this baby will become. His whole life really is a Christmas story. The man this baby would become would tell us to love our enemies, to turn the other cheek. He would impart the message that life is not caught up in the abundance of possessions. But he would reveal to us what it means to be truly human, that in losing one's life, you will find a life that's worth living. And the blessing of Christmas is not only caught up in his birth, but in his death. That this baby boy would grow up to be a man who would give his life for us, to offer us salvation. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that he brought us, peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. From Isaiah 53. The message and power of Christmas is not only in Jesus' birth, but also in his death. Through his death, the price was paid that we could not pay. This we will miss if we leave the baby in that, if we leave Jesus in that manger. One of the most popular hymns around at Christmas time, and we actually sang it at Christmas Eve, is What Child Is This? It was written in 1865 by William Dix. But there's always one verse of that hymn that we leave out. In fact, it's not even in our Methodist hymnal because it refers to Jesus' death. And it doesn't seem appropriate to mention his death in a hymn to beautifully celebrate his birth. Here's that missing verse that you will not find in the hymnal. Nails, spears shall pierce him through. The cross be born for me, for you. Hail, hail, the word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. It's our great misfortune in life if we leave that Jesus lying in a manger, a mere baby, to be innocent and undemanding with little bearing on our lives, except for once a year. And what we would be forgetting is the reality that we cannot fix ourselves. We all in need of redemption, and Jesus, and God gave us a way out. God gave us a path. We needed a Savior, and God knew that. So at Christmas, our Savior was born, and we are all children of God. A God who will go to great lengths to shower us with his love even to cross that barrier, to step out of the heavens to be with us. The word became flesh and made his home among us. We have seen his glory, glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. As we venture out in this new year, 2022, let's not lose sight of Jesus. Let us not leave him lying in the manger until next year but let him live in our lives. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we have shared in this season of joy in the time of Christmas, we, we pray that this time will be a time that we will truly have some rest and renewal, that we bask in the presence of the hope and peace that fills us in this time of year. For you are the God of this new day and the upcoming new year. We pray that we never forget the true reason for this season. Let us focus not about just the gifts we received on Christmas, but the eternal and perfect gift given by you. May we always be truly thankful for all the sacrifices that you have made for us. And we pray that we'll never forget that you gave us your son to be with us, to be in us that you knew that we needed what we needed the most in our lives, in our human condition, we needed a savior. 
and you gave us one. Heavenly Father, we know that you are God that hears the needs of your people through prayers and response. So together we lift up the prayers of this congregation. We pray for those in our midst in our community that are ill and need your healing power. We pray for relief and healing from this new variant of COVID that's on a rampage. Protect us, deliver us. We pray for those we know who are suffering from it as we speak. We also pray for those who are traveling or will be traveling during this time of the year. And as we face the beginning of a new year, we are praying for those who are overwhelmed by life's burdens, that are struggling with great obstacles they are facing. May your grace flow to their lives through the kindness of one another or by other means to give them the hope that is needed. For we offer these, these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. During our final worship song today, um, we invite all of you who want to give of your tithes and offering to move to the baskets that are here or those in the front or in the back. Um, there also is always four ways that you can give online. Um, we have, you can, well, you can mail it in mobile, online, and text. And so whether you're um, at home or here, this is your opportunity now. And I do want to say thank you for your faithfulness. I just know it is by the grace of God and because of your faithfulness to God that um, we made it through 21. And we will continue to make it forward by the grace of God and through your generosity. So thank you. Bless the Lord of my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing my name. Yeah. 
And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever more. Forever more. Bless thou my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship his holy. pray. Father, we love you, and I pray that we do come before you to worship you, uh, not just today, but in our lives and every day and in every interaction we have with people. And I pray that this week uh, we would be people who are known for sharing your love with others. And in your name, amen. Well, thank you all for joining us this morning, whether it was in person or online, and I pray that you have a good week. Take the points, at us. <laughs>